<clears throat> Jesus, thank you so much for who you are. Lord, we just want to catch a glimpse of you this morning. We just want you to break through in our lives, to interrupt our casual uh, thought processes, our casual conversations, and to touch us with the grace of heaven, Lord. We want a glimpse of who you are. We want a glimpse of what you're doing in these last days, God. We want to be aware of what's going on so that we can be prepared for it. And Lord, we want to believe. We want to follow you. We want to be faithful no matter what, Lord. Uh, so come, and come into our lives. Uh, revive us. Consecrate us to you so that no matter what happens, we can say, I want to follow you. I want to stand on your word. I want to be among your people, and no matter, no matter what the cost. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. So our topic this morning is uh, the United States and Bible prophecy, a fascinating topic. Many people wonder, uh, what is uh, the role of the, this country in Bible prophecy? Well, on July 2, 1776, was the Second Continental Congress in Philadelphia, uh, they had 56 delegates from 13 states, and they were trying to, to decide whether or not to declare independence from England. And so they kind of discussed back and forth. It was a lively discussion. They stayed up most of the night trying to decide. And when they finally came to cast the vote, the vote for independence was deadlocked. It was a tie. And they couldn't go one way or the other. And so when the, they, but then they realized that Delaware had three votes, but one of the delega, Delaware delegates was out on his farm. Um, he, was, uh, he was there, it was raining, the roads were filled with mud, he couldn't make it to the place. So the word went out, they sent the messenger to the delegate who was out on his farm saying, the vote is deadlocked, we need you to come cast the deciding vote. And so that man jumped on his horse, and he, and he went for the hours to make it to the Congress there in Philadelphia. And when he came in, oh, and so then he was coming into the Congress to cast the deciding vote. And legend has it that uh, there was a boy who was sent by his grandfather, who was a bell ringer, uh, to check on how things were going at the Second Continental Congress. And... Uh, and he said, if, if independence is decided, I want you to tell me so that I can ring the bell. And so he said, okay. So the young grandson runs to the Congress and he finds a crack in the door and he's able to kind of sneak, and sneak a peek inside to see what's going on, catch a glimpse of the proceedings. And sure enough, that third delegate from Delaware finally arrived in, came in and cast the deciding vote for independence. And so the little boy ran out to his grandfather and said, Ring, Grandpa, ring for liberty. This was, and this is the story behind the Liberty Bell there in Philadelphia. This was the first time a nation was born on the principle of religious liberty. The first time in history. The United States Constitution guarantees freedom. The U.S. has been a great champion of liberty throughout the world. Uh, even the French Revolution, during, during that time, the French tried to, um, tried to start on a different, on that kind of note, but their motives were different. It never worked out. They were tired of this medieval church that was controlling everything and getting into everything, so they swung the totally opposite direction. They were atheistic, and they tried to pull God out of the entire picture altogether. Um, but it, of course, didn't work out and didn't last for long. So the, the colonists in America, though, they got it right. They didn't discharge God. They didn't discount God, take him out of the scenario altogether. But they said God is very important to our lives, and to, it, but different people have different ways of worshiping him. And so under, and different people have different ways of understanding what he's like. And everyone ought to be free to honor him according to their own conscience. And so that was the principle, the foundation that this nation was built on, that everyone ought to be able to worship God according to his own conscience. The Constitution was written at a time when religious oppression had been very real. The, um, we, we talked about how uh, this was they, all these colonists, the people who came to America, they had been suffering from oppression and persecution. They knew what, how important it was 
to be able to follow their own conscience rather than the dictates of the state. But the question is, will these historic freedoms ever be changed, right? Will things ever change in the land of the free? It's a good question. Does the Bible mention the United States in prophecy? Well, let's go to the book of Revelation and find out. Revelation, we're going to be in Revelation chapter 13. If you want to follow along in your Bibles, you're welcome to. I'll have it up on the screen as well. But we're going to look at Revelation chapter 13. Earlier in the seminar, there are two beasts in Revelation chapter 13. Early in the seminar, we unpacked the first beast, the beast out of the sea, Uh, This is the same beast that is affiliated with, who has a mark, or the mark of the beast. Um, And so we saw, we we explored what that is, and we saw how um, this Roman church system uh, is represented there in that first beast. But then we see another beast come onto the scene in Revelation 13, beginning at verse 11. If you'd like to follow along, that's, if you're, if you have an Andrew Study Bible, it's page 1676. And so, um, so let's look at uh, this second beast. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Okay, whoa. Two horns like a lamb. Now, uh, now, who does the lamb usually represent in the Bible? Jesus, right? But then spoke like a dragon. Who's the dragon usually represent in the Bible? Okay, this is going to be a pretty... Uh, Pretty interesting or pretty sneaky beast, right? Well, we know that uh, in Bible prophecy, a beast represents what? A nation, a political power, right? The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth. We see this over and over in Bible prophecy. And so we, we remember from Daniel 7 how each beast represented a new nation that would come up. These beasts were coming out of the sea. The, the lion with wings was Babylon. The bear with three ribs in his mouth was Medo-Persia. The, the leopard with four heads and four wings was Greece. The nondescript beast with iron teeth that crushed everyone and ten horns, that was the nation of Rome. So all these nations are coming up out of the sea. They're coming up into uh, being a world empire. And so we see now a new beast is coming on the scene in Revelation 13. And what would this beast be like? Well, there's three questions we need to answer. The first one is, where does this power come from? The second one is, when does it rise? And the third one is, how does it rise? So that's how we're, what we're going to follow in our study this morning. So the first one, where does this power come from? This new beast doesn't actually come out of the sea like all the beasts had before it. The first beast in Revelation 13, all the beasts in Daniel 7, they came out of the sea. This one comes out of somewhere else. So this, we see it by contrast. Now you remember the beasts that come out of the sea, what does the sea represent in Bible prophecy? Nations, peoples, right? Many peoples. And so all these other beasts were coming out of these highly populated areas, but now we see something a little bit different. Where does it come from? Revelation 13, 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the what? The earth. It's a different, it's a different spot, the earth. And so this, now we're reminded, this isn't the first time this whole idea of the non-populated areas has come up in Bible prophecy. Remember some context here, so that we're in Revelation 13. In the chapter before it, Revelation 12, it talked about, we studied this together, it talked about the church in the wilderness, how when the, when the church had turned against God, when they'd gone apostate, the true believers had gone into the wilderness or into the non-populated, the earth helped the woman. The, it, they went into an, a non-populated area so that they could continue following God. And so an example was, this was a place where there were very few people, a time where people could, um, could study the Bible for themselves without the scrutiny and persecution of the state powers forcing them uh, what to do. And so, uh, so this, is, this is that time when the, when the true people of God went underground. Uh, so to review Revelation 12, 13, this is just the chapter before it, the dragon persecuted the woman, and the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place, where she is nourished for a time, times, and half a time. Well, what's this time, times, and half a time talking about? This is the same 1260-day prophecy that we see several times throughout Scripture, throughout Revelation. And um, this time, time is a word for year in uh, a term that they use for it. There are 360 days there in the Jewish calendar. And so when you look at one year, 360 plus two years times, 720 
plus half a time, 180, you get 1260. It's the same prophecy that's mentioned. It's, it's mentioned as 42 months. It's mentioned as 1260 days. It's mentioned as three and a half years, but it's all the same time period. That's when that, basically when that church, when that, uh, when the church was totally unhindered and went totally ap apostate, were persecuting the people of God, and, and were unhindered from basically causing, terrorizing the true people who wanted to follow the word of God. But that's when the, so the true church goes underground and where she is nourished for a time, times, and half a time for the, from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood, nations or multitudes, after the woman to be carried away with the flood. So the true, true, true believers go into the wilderness, but then the serpent's trying to throw more people at him. So Europe was this place where Christianity kind of rose up during the Middle Ages. It was the, the place of many peoples, nations, tribes, um, all, it was the populated center of the world there, around the Mediterranean Sea and Europe area. And so, because the state power was Christian, the subjects then became considered Christian as well. Not necessarily by inward transformation, but by outward profession, by dictates of the state. Now, question, is it possible to be a true Christian because, the, because you live in a Christian country? Is that how you become a Christian? Do you become a Christian because the state decides that you're a Christian? No, you become a Christian by making a personal decision to follow Christ. But the church was not along these lines. They said, we're, just, we're, we're spreading Christianity through politics. And so that's what they did. So this official state church begins, so people are following the lead of the state church rather than the lead of Jesus Christ. And so the state church actually goes and starts persecuting those who are reading their Bible and not following in line with the state. This is that time of apostasia that uh, 2 Thessalonians talks about. This is that time of persecution where the state church is, is persecuting the true followers of God. But the earth, remember we saw that in Revelation 13, the earth helped the woman and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. So the earth is the same place where this land beast comes from and just a few verses later in Revelation 13. So this, this, the non-populated areas. Well, beginning in the 17th century, pilgrims came to America, the new world. They were looking for a new life. It was not a populated area and provided safety for many devoted Europeans to take refuge from religious persecution. They knew what it was like to have the state on their backs telling them what to do, and they said, we want freedom from this. We want to be able to go according to our own conscience. So these pilgrims found refuge in escaping, escaped the flood of the dragon that it was talked about here in Europe by coming over to America. And so they came, this is a nation that was built on immigrants. The people from all different countries left their homes to start a new life founded on the principle of freedom. And you know, I believe this nation is really, it has been really blessed by God. I believe this nation is a nation of destiny. I believe God has used this nation to impact many, many people in so many positive ways. It is a blessing to be part of this nation. So when the pilgrims came to this, came to this place, uh, it became a place that was founded on the principle saying you can worship God any way you want as your conscience dictates. You don't have to live in a place where the church and state are together. You don't have to answer to the king on how you're going to worship or how you should believe. You can worship God based on how you know God to be. And that was the fundamental principle. So this new beast in Revelation that we're studying this morning comes up out of the earth or an unpopulated area. So that's where it comes from. Let's see where else. When does this power arise? What timing? Well, we see in Revelation 13, 10, the transition between the sea beast and the land beast. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. So this is a, the same power of the Roman apostate church that made many captives during this 1260-year time period of persecution. Now it would become captive itself to the ambitious expansion of Napoleon Bonaparte in 1798. It was granted to him, the beast, to make war with the saints and overcome them. So this time of apostasy, like we've talked about, the church persecuted dissenters for this 1260-year period, unhindered, until it was dealt 
a fatal wound in 1798. The Pope uh, was taken captive by Napoleon's general, Berthier, and he took the Pope captive, and they took him over to France and, and held him hostage there until he ended up dying in captivity only a little while later. And, the, and Napoleon said there's not going to be any new Pope elected. And so this was really the end of this uh, dominant, uh, over a millennia of dominance there by the state church power. So, the Im- so, so this, is a, this is what had happened, the same, the same beast that had taken them into captivity uh, taken others captive, now has been taken captive themselves. So the land beast, or the image of the sea beast, rose after the sea beast was weakened. You see this? After the sea beast was weakened, around this same time, we see. And then the third question, how does this power arise? Uh, let's look at it, Revelation thirteen eleven. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and spoke like a dragon. So what are horn symbols of in Bible prophecy? Power, right? I heard it. Very good. Power. So two horns like a lamb. So these two horns, these two uh, are these Christian values, these freedom and democracy. These have been the horns where America has drawn its power over so many decades, over so many years. See, originally America, this lamb-like beast, uh, alludes to Christ, the lamb. So uh, America was originally a lamb, a Christian nation and drew its strength from its Christian values and its freedom uh, and democracy, this, this dem- democratic political system. This nation, when it was founded, was very unique. No nation like it had ever been founded before on the same kinds of values. And you also notice on these two horns, there's no crowns on the horns of this second beast. Now, the first beast that it talked about, they had ten horns with ten crowns, having seen heads and having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns, ten crowns. Crowns, so we see crowns on the first one. Crowns represent monarchical, monarchical governments, the kingly authority, right? These, this power that, that had the, the kingly authority could tell people what to do uh, from the from that kind of authority, but we see the lack of crowns indicates freedom and democracy. There's freedom from that kingly authority of the second beast. The horns are a symbol of power, like we mentioned before, and so the second beast derives its political and derives its power from political and religious freedom. This is where our power comes from. This is where our power comes from. The power of our of our congregated individual opinions, the power of the vote, the power of sharing personal ideas and being heard, the power of freedom and democracy, all of these things. This is where our country draws its power. And so all these, all of which are amazing development of, of the history of society because we have never seen anything like this before in history where a nation was founded like this. Not even Rome in the, in the times of the Senate, not even Greece in their heyday have seen what this nation has seen in the last 200 years. So to summarize, the lamb-like beast arises as the first one, the, the sea beast is being taken captive. So let's review a little bit. That's around 1798. So this is the time frame. Number two, arises in a relatively unpopulated area. Number three, its power would not come from kingly authority. Number four, it would absorb religious freedom. Uh, it would, sorry, it would absorb relig- European religious persecution. So the question is, who is the only nation that fits this description? What is the only nation in history that fits this description? You got it, right? You got it. The United States uh, in Bible prophecy. So, so we see the United States of America is the only one. Started at this time, time period, came from the unpopulated area, founded on freedom and democracy. And so uh, George Townsend writes about it this way, a historian, says, the mystery from seed to empire, the mystery of her, America, coming forth from vacancy like a silent seed, we grew into an empire. And so we see the rise of the United States, this 1776, the Declaration of Independence, and then 1783, Independence Acknowledged, 1787, Constitution Framed, 1791, Bill of Rights Added, 1798, Recognition by France, 1863, the Slave Emancipation Pro- uh, Act. And so these, this rise of a new nation is coming into fruition. There are so many people from around all different parts of the world that have come into that New York Harbor and seen that Statue of Liberty 
and, and their hearts have leapt for joy within them, saying, wow, I have another chance. I have a new life. I have liberty. I've got a new shot at things. That's what this nation has been founded on for centuries. But the question is, will liberty be ours forever? I mean, we are the champions of individual rights, aren't we? We are the ones who hold people to the fire regarding individual rights. Will that ever be different in our great nation? Well, according to Revelation chapter 13, things will change. We see a, a new development here, starting at verse 12, Revelation 13, 12, and it says, He exercises the authority, this is this lamb-like beast, speaking of the United States, He exercises the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So we see a resurgence of the first beast, this Roman state church system, and so we're say, we see now this, this land beast is causing all who dwell on the earth to worship the first beast. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. So what is the image to the beast? What is the image of the beast? Well, an image is what? It's the, a likeness of something. It's something reflecting the substance. When you look in the mirror, you see an image of who you are, right? Now, that's not the real thing. You can't reach out and touch you, but it's an image. It's reflecting who you really are. So this is an image to the beast. So we remember the, the, the sea beast is papal Rome, this church-state union. This is what made it so uh, diabolically problematic and so then we see the second beast in Revelation 13 is this land beast, or America, and we see it will now, it will become a church-state union. And so, but you may protest. Wait a second, America believes in what? Separation of what? Church and state, right? But the truth is that that wall between church and state is crumbling. And if you pay close attention, you can even see that little evidences of this happening along the way. There's many, many evidences of it, uh, but here's just one significant example. Uh, on June 18, 2015, a papal encyclical to everyone, not just Catholics, on climate change, uh, he admonished Sunday rest to aid the situation. So normally, uh, papal encyclicals circulate among the faithful or among the, the the, just the church members, but this one was addressed to everyone in the world, not just Catholics. And so the Pope, he suggests, we ought to have Sunday rest, we ought to have a global or national Sunday law or Sunday rest in order to help climate change around us. Well, how did America respond to this kind of a, an idea? Well, President Obama roundly supported the Pope's encyclical. He said, this is a great idea. This is, uh, I, I think, I think you, you're on to something here. So church and so that's just one of many evidences we see of this gradual shift, the wall between separation of church and state crumbling down little by little, or possibly faster than that. The church and state will eventually unite to enforce religious practices. But the truth is that revival in our nation won't come by legislation, but by personal consecration to Jesus and His Word. We want revival, don't we? We want that. This is, why, this is why people want to make laws to make us more Christian. This is why people want to make laws to make us follow God, uh, this, this whole state, to enforce this whole statement, one nation under God. But the problem is, when you legislate that, you get into deep trouble. The same trouble we experience in history, those who do not learn from history are bound to repeat their mistakes. So it's not, so it's not forcing your neighbor to go to church but it's surrendering. Revival doesn't come by forcing your neighbor to go to church. Revival doesn't come by legislating Christian values. Revival comes by personally surrendering your life to Jesus Christ and His Word and inviting Jesus to work in you and through you and in spite of you on behalf of others. That is true revival. That's the revival that God calls all of us to take part in. That's the revival that is needed in our nation is personal 
transformation and consecration to Jesus. Does the Bible give any indication of end-time events in light of this union, this union between this papal Rome power and this United States power? Well, yes, it does. Uh, in Revelation 17, it talks about this scarlet whore, this apostate church. Uh, the, this is the, the bride of Christ gone bad, and uh, the, the woman is, got, is this apostate church, and now she's riding on a beast. A beast is a political power, so this is now an amalgamated power, a church state power that we've seen enacted in history. And so we see this in Revelation 17, it talks about this. And then in Revelation 18, we find the judgment sent to Babylon and the reasons why. So events surrounding this union, this church state union and its affiliates and partners together, uh, we'll just go rapid fire through some of them in Revelation 18. Her sins have reached to heaven. Now you tell me, do you think that our nation is becoming more and more wicked or that our nation is becoming better and better people? What do you think? More wicked, right? It's no question. It's no guess. Uh, it, we're, our sins are beginning to reach toward heaven. You know, back in the day, right, some of you guys may remember this, and maybe I'm even a little too young for it, but I still remember when I was younger. Back in the day, did you have to worry about locking your house or locking your car? I mean, you could just leave your place unlocked and come back to it a week later and no big deal. Do you do that today? Things have changed, haven't they? Things have changed dramatically in only a few years. We see that happening. Number two, she has lived luxuriously. Does that describe us or what? Does that describe us or what? This whole, uh, lug we have lived luxuriously. We've lived like kings in our country. We have nothing to complain about. We have nothing. Simply being born into this country's culture and society, even the lifestyle of people who are, are in the lowest sectors of it on welfare or disability, those kinds of things, they would be considered super wealthy in other countries of the world. Even people who have, quote unquote, no money here are rich beyond all belief in other nations. We have lived luxuriously. Half of the world's population lives on less than $2.50 a day. We have nothing to complain about. We live as kings in this world. Go on a mission trip sometime and see for yourself. Get that different perspective. Let God open your eyes to how most people live around the world. I remember spending eight months in Cambodia, uh, one of the poorest countries in Southeast Asia, and um, and it was, it was pretty profound. I was working there at a Seventh Avenue school and orphanage. I was teaching English and Bible classes. And, um, and the other, I was volunteering there. The other local Cambodian teachers that worked at the school full time, they would get paid $100 a month as their salary. $100 a month. And that was enough to live on over there. Uh, it was inexpensive to live just because of the low economy. But think about it. Most of them will never own a, via, a car in their lifetime. So by the fact that I owned a car made me super wealthy. Top tier of society. Way out of their league that they could ever even grasp. Even if I felt like I, even if I thought that I only had a few bucks in my pocket. And so we here are, have it, so, we are so rich. We are so luxurious, no matter how much money we think we have or don't have, we are in the top, top tier of the world in wealth and luxury. We have it very good here, but this describes us, doesn't it? We've lived luxuriously. She experiences natural disasters. Aren't we seeing more and more of these? More and more natural disasters, more and more of these kinds of things taking place in our country. God's judgments fall. God's judgments fall. We're recognizing that there's more and more unrest. There's more and more protests. There's more and more disunity. Do you remember Occupy Wall Street that happened a few years ago? Basically, a movement with, with no organization sprung up people of all different walks of life with no real uh, structure to it came together for this protest movement that would receive global attention and last for quite some time. And so there's something in the hearts of people saying, something is not quite right that's going on here. Something is not quite right. Her riches come to nothing. 
There are no guarantees, even for uh, even in our investments, in our in our investments, in our 401 our 401k could become a 201k in a in a in a very short amount of time. There are no guarantees in in this country. There's no guarantees, and some people are looking at it and saying, you know what? Uh, we we base a lot of hope on these things, but all it would take is one crisis for everything to change immediately. So as spiritual decline, natural disasters, social chaos, economic difficulties lead up to expected, they lead up to an expected church and state union. So all these things will eventually lead this great nation to say, we have to tighten up. For the sake of security, we're going to start taking away some individual freedoms. Now this actually happened after 9-11. Do you remember that? Anybody, any of you remember the difference between traveling before 9-11 and after 9-11? Some of you guys remember that? It used to be so much easier to travel, didn't it? It used to be so much. Now, I've been to over 30 countries around the world, and every time, the most difficult country to get into by far is my own, my own country. I walk up with an American passport, and it's way harder to get into this country than anywhere else. Things have changed. It, secure, for the sake of security, individual freedoms have been, uh, have been modified or absorbed or adjusted. When we go to the airport, it can turn into an all-day affair just trying to get past the security checkpoint now. We've given up some of those conveniences and freedoms for the sake of what? For the sake of security. Because it's a matter of security. Think about what would happen with a few more 9-11s taking place. Think about what, what more we would be willing to give up in our freedoms for the sake of security. It's a no-brainer. It's not that hard for some of these things that the Bible has prophesied to take place to actually take place. All it takes is a little bit of crisis. Oh, but that would never happen here. Well, before 9-11, no one would have ever seen that scenario taking place, would they? We just don't see it. See, it doesn't matter. See, the truth is that America votes with its pocketbook. It doesn't matter how much we like somebody. It doesn't matter how much we like their ideas. If the economy is going south, out they go and in comes somebody else, right? That's how America votes. And so that means that if we get into, if we get into trouble and my lifestyle starts suffering, I want to make a change. Even if it means moving away from individual rights, I'll make the sacrifice because I want to keep the lifestyle that I have. That's the kind of nation that we live in. Our Arthur Meyer Schlesinger, um, he is a, a historian. He's a specialist in American history, and uh, he actually worked closely with some of the, um, he focuses on some of the leaders of our country, like Harry Truman, Franklin D. Roosevelt, John F. Kennedy, Robert Kennedy. So he's a, a very well-known historian, and this is what he writes. What makes the current situation worse today is the world faces a spreading recession that will intensify every grievance, every antagonism, every hatred. Hard times sharpen animosity and conflict. People who can't find jobs look around for some other to blame, the, the blacks or the Jews or the immigrants or those keeping the Sabbath, for example, we could insert in there. Some group to blame. If the U.S. goes into depression, it will not be a melting pot it will be a boiling pot. This is what this historian said, recognizing that when crisis, when, th when, when we don't have our needs provided for, things start to get chaotic. And we see this happening around the world, don't we? We see in areas with, with famines and with difficult uh, natural disasters and with uh, uh, going on uh, droughts and all these kinds of things happening, we see political unrest in the same place. We see wars in the same places. We see these things. Whenever things begin to unravel, Society itself begins to unravel, and all of a sudden there's somebody to blame for these kinds of things. Satan likes to take advantage of our situation. So we see that Satan takes advantage of this situation in the future by introducing a false spiritual revival. It is, most, it is mostly Christians crying out saying, we need this great nation to go back to God, which is true. But Satan will re introduce a revival of false nature, right? We see in Revelation 13, he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he would granted to do in the sight of the beast. 
So these signs are happening. It's, it, becomes, it becomes this amazing experience, but it's about signs and wonders. It's not about Jesus Christ. See, Jesus warned about people in the time of the end saying it this way, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does what? The will of my Father in heaven. See, I know that there are some here struggling with some of the things you've learned from the Bible here in the seminar. And let me tell you that it is by doing the will of God that we make it to heaven. This is what Jesus himself said. That is where our peace comes from. That is where our assurance comes from. That is where all security can be found when we place ourselves in the will of God, when we yield all to Jesus, when we say, I'm going to follow your truth. I don't know how it's all going to work out in my life, but I'm going to stand on your word. That is where our security comes. That is where our, that's the safest place to stand in a world crumbling down. Jesus continues, many will say to me in that day, Lord have, we, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? These are major things, right? Prophesying, casting out demons, doing wonders. These are pretty significant things. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice what? lawlessness. What matters to Jesus is not all the religious stuff you've done, even if it's of a miraculous nature. What matters to Jesus is whether or not the law, the character of God, is in your heart. That's what matters to Jesus, that we've given our whole lives to him. There are people all over this country who enjoy, uh, they enjoy the, the whole religious experience for the fellowship or for the services, for the entertainment, for the miracles, uh, all these kinds of things. But when they're faced with something in the Bible that they don't agree with, they say, no thanks, and walk away. They have to have the last word instead of letting God have the last word. Are you that kind of Christian? Are you that kind of Christian? Isaiah 8.20 says, To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. If the devil wanted to unite people religiously, what means would he use? Well, it's a good question. Uh, it's not that hard to find an answer if we just look back in history. What has he done before, right? Well, what means did he use in early Christianity? You may remember back in uh, the early centuries, Constantine became the emperor uh, of the Roman Empire, and he became a Christian, quote-unquote. And so as a Christian, more, a good chance of more of a political mover, maneuver than anything, he sees that, oh, all the pagans are worshiping on Sunday, the sun god, and he sees, oh, many Christians are worshiping on Sunday as well, and he says, I got a great idea. It seems like the, it, you know, this, this Sunday thing for the Christians, of course, it's not according to the Bible, but it seems like a, you know, a, a, a good tradition I've got a good idea, so let's uni unify them together. Let's all unite together. Let's make a law that says everybody worship on Sunday, and then we're all at the same level. Well, we've already learned that the church was also behind this change from, uh, from Sabbath to Sunday, and so since it was what many people were already doing, it made it easy to pass, right? Politicians know that if you can only pass something that has support of the majority, Right? And so he, so he passed it, and so it, had this, this, it was supported by this majority, although to the detriment of the minority. To conciliate the pagans to nominal Christianity, Rome, pursuing its usual policy, took measures to get the Christians and pagan festivals amalgamated, and to get paganism and Christianity now, uh, now far sunk in idolatry, in this, as in so many other things, to shake hands." So the devil's going to do the same thing again. Our nation that was founded on the premise of separation of church and state, but this premise has, has been challenged, is being challenged now for quite some time. Listen to this interest, interesting quotation by the chief justice at the time, William Rehnquist, Rehnquist. And he said, the, separation, the wall of separation between church and state is a metaphor based on bad history. It should be frankly and explicitly what? Abandoned. This is the chief justice of the nation saying this, that it should be abandoned. 
1951, the Congress soundly rejected President Truman's proposal for the U.S. Ambas for a U.S. ambassador to be sent to the Vatican, right? The U.S. doesn't send an ambassador to the Baptist Church or to the Seventh-day Adventist Church or to the Methodist Church. And so they said, no, this, we're not going to do this. But then in 1986, Congress easily passed President Reagan's proposal for a U.S. ambassador to the Vatican. We see some of these developments happening. This is the first time, only these past few years, is the first time in history that the U.S. Supreme Court has had a Catholic majority. And so five out of the nine justices, now these people are good jurists. They do, they're, they're, they're there for their job and they're not to impose their personal religious views. Well, I understand that. But every person comes with a package. Every person comes with a history and with an experience, with, with a mindset, with presuppositions that come into this. And we saw, we've also seen, ruling in uh, June 26, 2015, the U.S. Supreme Court rules in favor of same-sex marriage. So this was in spite of the fact that most of these justices are Catholic, but the decision would be, and that this decision would be against Catholic doctrine, but the point is, they ruled in favor of popular opinion. Popular opinion. Listen to what uh, John Roberts' dissenting opinion said about this. He said, petitioners make strong arguments rooted in social policy and considerations of fairness, but this court is not a what? A legislature. Under the Constitution, judges have power to say what the law is, not what it should be. The majority's decision to act of, is an act of will, not legal judgment. The right it announces has no basis in the Constitution or this court's precedent. It is openly relying on its desire to remake society. The point is obvious. The Supreme Court can become activist in spite of the Constitution. We've already seen it take place. History shows the Supreme Court has ruled in detriment of racial minorities. If it can rule in detriment of minorities in the past, it can do it again in the future as well. This is a great country championing individual freedoms, but has actually violated those in various instances in the past. 1857, Dred Scott decision, formal sanction of slavery. No Negro could be a citizen of the United States. This seems preposterous at this time, doesn't it? But yet there was no discussion about it back then. It, it was a no-brainer to them. In 1908, Berea College versus Kentucky, the states could shut down private Christian colleges for welcoming Negro faculty and students. Now, this is the wording, this is the wording in the decision. Think about this. Christian schools wanted to be Christ-like. They wanted to be ample. They wanted to be inviting. They wanted to exhibit the character of Christ by saying, we're all brothers. According to Galatians, there is no Jew nor Greek. There is no slave nor free. All are one in Christ Jesus. There's not one that's better than another. All are one in Christ Jesus. We want to embrace you. We want to have you be a part of this. And the state says, you can't do that or we will shut you down. You see this, this conflict, you're going to be penalized if you do that. Racial minority rights were limited, a clear injustice. And this is, this is a years, many, many years, decades after the Civil War had already ended long ago. In 1943, Japanese relocation camps. You remember, uh, Japanese Americans were treated like second-rate citizens. Those who had been, these are Americans, these are people born in California and Oregon and Washington, who just because of their parents or their grandparents or their great-grandparents' nationality are now being discriminated against, and they were sent to relocation camps, deported to other places and work camps, and treated like slaves. For what? Because of fear for the sake, taking away individual rights of minorities for the sake of security, right? Violating individual rights. State Sunday laws have been passed. Most Sunday, actually there are many states that already have Sunday laws on the books today, but they're generally not enforced right now. Listen to what Justice William O. Douglas says. Uh, he wrote a dissent some years ago on the state's reasoning for enacting Sunday laws, and he says, it seems to be plain that by these laws, the states compel one under sanction of law to refrain from work or recreation on Sunday because of the majority's views on that day. The state, by law, makes Sunday a symbol of respect or adherence. 
He's saying, so he's saying that just because the majority believes this way doesn't mean that the minority should suffer for it, right? That's the principle that we all want to live by. Revival in our nation won't come by legislation, but by personal consecration to Jesus and his word. The union of church and, and state on paper would seem like a good idea, right? Why wouldn't we want that? Why wouldn't we want this nation to be more Christian? Why wouldn't we want our politicians to pay more attention to Christian values? But all those things are good. But as soon as you have the state running things and the state legislating things, it will lead to serious problems. Some of you may remember this. I wasn't around yet at that time, but in 1973, 74, there was a major oil embargo. Any of you guys remember that? happening? So, okay, you guys remember that major oil embargo that caused untold misery in millions of Americans needing to get gas. People had to wait for hours just to get some gas there at the, at the gas station. Listen to how Christians responded to that crisis. Listen to how they responded. Uh, Christianity Today, this is the editor of Christianity Today. Christianity Today is the most influential Christian magazine in this country. And so listen to what the editor says. Legalizing Sunday. As a result of the crisis, here's the solution. All businesses, including gasoline stations and restaurants, should close every Sunday by force of legislative fiat through the duly elected officials of the people. So the beast that rose silently will end up being, a major, being an image to the previous beast that was ruling during the time of apostasy. So we see that happening. Revelation 13, 15, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image should, of the beast should both speak and cause as many would, wor would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Wow, a death sentence, right? Anybody who doesn't worship is going to be killed. So he would speak and cause as many would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So how do you speak in a democracy, because in a monarchy, how do you speak? Well, the king or the queen speaks on, on behalf of the country, right? How do you speak in a, in a democracy, right? That's right, through Congress, through the legislations, right? The, we're, a re, we're a representative government here, so we, we have representatives there in Congress, and they speak on behalf of the people to legislate and create law. So that's how a nation, a democracy, speaks. How do you cause things to happen in a democracy? How do you cause things to happen? By, did I hear it? By the court system, by the judicial branch of the government, right? You cause them to happen. You enforce the laws that were spoken. So, this con so Congress, may, Congress speaks, and the court uh, causes or makes the, uh, makes the laws, the judicial branch enforces. So we see this beast here in Revelation. They're going, it's going to legislate and adjudicate in favor of of this first beast in favor of this state church system. Pat Robertson is a well-admired and respected Christian leader, wrote a book a few years ago uh, called New World Order. This is what he says. The next obligation that a citizen of God's world order owes is to himself. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy is a command for the personal benefit of each citizen. Higher civilizations rise when people can rest and draw inspiration from God. Laws in America that mandated a day of rest, Sunday laws, have been nullified as a violation of separation in church and state. As an outright insult to God and his plan, only those policies that can be shown to have clearly secular purpose are recognized. So he's trying to speak out against secularism, but he swung the other way and he's advocating Sunday laws. He's saying these, these laws that aren't enforced, we need to go back and start enforcing them. That's how revival will happen. But revival in our nation won't come by legislation, but by personal consecration to Jesus and his word. Listen to the Bible's counsel for revival. What does the Bible say? Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Heal their land. It has nothing to do with legislation. It has nothing to do with majority over minority. It has to do with personal surrender, following God and his word, humbling ourselves and praying and seeking God, turning from our wicked ways and saying, Jesus, all for you. I'm giving all of this to you. I want to live your way. I, want, I belong to you. May your spirit work in my life. Hebrews 8.10 says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. 
I will put my laws in their mind. I will write them in their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. When Jesus came, he was trying to move these Pharisees and Sadducees from the letter of the law to the spirit of the law, right? When he came, they were so stuck on the rules. They were so stuck on all these things. And so Jesus comes along in the Sermon on the Mount, and he says, you've heard that it was said, these sayings over here, you've heard it was said, do not murder. But I tell you that anyone who hates his brother has murdered him in his own heart from the letter of the law to the spirit of the law. Going even further, you've heard that it was said, do not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks after a woman and lusts after her has committed adultery in his heart. So Jesus was moving people. They had all these rules about the Sabbath, and Jesus saying, the spirit of the Sabbath is so much greater. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. It's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. So the Sabbath is a sign of this love relationship between the creator and the creation. And so Jesus is saying he's moving us toward that spirit of the law as well. I will write my laws on your mind. I will write my laws on your heart so that our very desire is to live for Jesus, is to live like Jesus, is to live with Jesus so that he changes us. We've experienced his grace. His grace is transforming our lives. It's changing us into a better person. Those same angry, natural reactions that we usually get to the challenges in our life, all of a sudden... We say, thank you, Jesus, for giving me patience and helping me treat this person like you would right now. These same situations where we get impatient and upset or impatient and uh, we say, thank you, Jesus, for helping me show love just like you would right now. The same situation where we get really discouraged and down and depressed. All these terrible things are happening. We say, thank you, Jesus. You're with me right now. And that's all I need. That's all I need. I will write my law in your heart's and minds. That's what Jesus promises to his people. As Jesus says, I want to fill you with my spirit. I want to write my laws on your hearts and minds. Thank you, Jesus, for coming into our lives. May you do it more. Thank you, Jesus, for consuming our affections. May you do it more. Thank you, Jesus, for changing our desires. May you do it more. Thank you, Jesus, for victory over sin. May you do it more. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us the courage to follow you no matter what. May you do it more. Jesus understands that following him will not be the easiest thing. And and in fact, Jesus, it's not like Jesus is saying, you know, what I'm going to ask you to do is actually going to be very difficult. I'm sorry for that. I really am. Uh, But you still need to go ahead and do it. I'm, I'm really sorry about causing this inconvenience. Does Jesus say that? No, Jesus says, I've got something so much better for you than you have for yourself. My word, I'm a loving, I'm a loving heavenly father. I'm a lo- I love you so much. I want what's best for you. And you're holding yourself back. You're sidelining yourself from it. So he says, I want to give you this gift. Come with me. It may be challenging, but guess what? It's going to grow your character in the process. And that's what really matters for eternity. And so Jesus says, I'll walk with you. I'll walk with you. I may, I may be asking, you may not have all the answers. You may not know how it's going to work out when you talk to your boss about getting Sabbath off from Friday sunset to Saturday sunset, but you know you want to honor God and you're going to trust Jesus to walk with you through that journey. You may not know how it's going to work out to get that victory over that addiction that's, that's just plaguing you down and dragging you down, but you're going to trust Jesus and you're going to, you say, Jesus, I know you don't need this for me. I know you don't want this for me and I'm going to trust you. I'm going to leave this all behind. I'm going to let claim your victory. Thank you for working in my life. Whatever it is, Jesus says he's not afraid of the challenges that we're going to face because when you are with Jesus, you will win. You will win. He's all we need. Revelation 14, 12 says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. May our lives be so consumed with Jesus that all we want to do is be like him. Revival in this nation won't come by legislation, but by personal consecration to Jesus and his word.